Things Fall Apart by Chinua Achebe, Part 1, Chapter 10. Large crowds began to gather on the village Ilo as soon as the edge had worn off the sun's heat and it was no longer painful on the body. Most communal ceremonies took place at that time of the day, so that even when it was said that a ceremony would begin after the midday meal, everyone understood that it would begin a long time later when the sun's heat had softened. It was clear from the way the crowd stood or sat that the ceremony was for men. There were many women, but they looked on from the fringe like outsiders. The titled men and elders sat on their stools waiting for the trials to begin. In front of them was a row of stools on which nobody sat. There were nine of them. Two little groups of people stood at a respectable distance beyond the stools. They faced the elders. There were three men in one group and three men and one woman in the other. The woman was Mbafo, and the three men with her were her brothers. In the other group were her husband, Uzowulu, and his relatives. Mbafo and her brothers were as still as statues into whose face the artist had molded defiance. Uzowulu and his relative, on the other hand, were whispering together. It looked like whispering but they were really talking at the top of their voices. Everybody in the crowd was talking. It was like the market. From a distance, the noise was a deep rumble carried by the wind. An iron gong sounded, setting up a wave of expectation in the crowd. Everyone looked in the direction of the Ogugu house. Gom, 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 went the gong and a powerful flute blew a high-pitched blast. Then came the voices of the Ogugu, guttural and awesome. The wave struck the women and children, and there was a backward stampede. But it was momentary. They were already far enough where they stood, and there was room for running away if any of the Ogugu should go towards them. The drum sounded again and the flutes blew. The Agugu house was now a pandemonium of quavering voices. Aruoyim, de 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 de, filled the air as the spirits of the ancestors just emerged from the earth, greeted themselves in their exoteric language. The Agugu house into which they emerged faced the forest away from the crowd, who saw only its back with the many colored patterns and drawings done by specially chosen women at regular intervals. These women never saw the inside of the hut. No woman ever did. They scrubbed and painted the outside walls under the supervision of men. If they imagined what was inside, they kept the imagination to themselves. No woman ever asked questions about the most powerful and the most secret cult in the clan. Aroim day 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 flew around the dark, closed hut like tongues of fire. The ancestral spirits of the clan were abroad. The metal gong beat continuously now, and the flute shrills and powerful floated on the chaos. And then the Agugu appeared. The women and children sent up a great shout and took to their heels. It was instinctive. A woman fled as soon as an Egugu came in sight. And when, as on that day, nine of the greatest Mark spirits in the clan came out together, it was a terrifying spectacle. Even Mbafo took to her heels and had to be restrained by her brothers. Each of the nine Egugu represented a village of the clan. Their leader was called Evil Forest. Smoke poured out of his head. The nine villages of Omorphia had grown out of the nine sons of the first father of the clan. Evil Forest represented the village of Umweru, or the children of Eru, 
who was the eldest of the nine sons. Omo of your Kwenu, shouted the lady near Gugu, pushing the air with his raffy arms. The elders of the clan replied, Ya! Omo of your Kwenu, Ya! Omo of your Kwenu, Ya! Evil spirits then thrust the pointed end of the rattling staff into the earth, and it began to shake and rattle like something agitating with a metallic life. He took the first of the empty stools and the eight other Egugu began to sit in order of seniority after him. Okonkwo's wives and perhaps other women as well might have noticed that the second Egugu had the spring walk of Okonkwo and they might also have noticed that Okonkwo was not among the titled men and elders who sat behind the role of Egugu. But if they thought those things, they kept them within themselves. The Egugu with the springy walk was one of the dead fathers of the clan. He looked terrible with a smoked raffia body, a huge wooden face painted white except for the round hollow eyes and the charred teeth that were as big as a man's fingers. On his head were two powerful horns. When all the Egugu had sat down, and the sound of the many bells and rattles on their bodies had subsided, Evil Forest addressed the two groups of people facing them. Uzo Wulu's body, I salute you. He said, spirits always addressed humans as bodies. Uzo Wulu bent down and touched the earth with his right hand as a sign of submission. Our father, my hand has touched the ground, he said. Uzawulu's body, do you know me? Asked the spirit. How can I know you, father? You are beyond our knowledge. Evil Forest then turned to the other group and addressed the elders of the three brothers. The body of Odukwe, I greet you, he said. An Odukwe bent down and touched the earth. The hearing then began. Uzo Ulu stepped forward and presented his case. That woman standing there is my wife, Mbwafo. I married her with my money and my yams. I do not owe my in-laws anything. I owe them no yams. I owe them no cocoa yams. One morning, three of them came to my house, beat me up and took my wife and children away. This happened in the rainy season. I have waited in vain for my wife to return. At last, I went to my in-laws and said to them, You have taken back your sister. I did not send her away. You yourselves took her. The law of the clan is that you should return her bright price. But my wife's brother said they had nothing to tell me. So I have brought the matter to the fathers of the clan. My case is finished. I salute you. Your words are good, said the leader of the Ogugu. Let us hear Odukwe. His words may also be good. Odukwe was short and thick set. He stepped forward, saluted the spirit, and began his story. My in law has told you that we went to his house, beat him up, and took our sister and her children away. All that is true. He told you that he came to take back her bride price and refused to give it him. That also is true. My in-law Uzawuli is a beast. My sister lived with him for nine years. During those years, no single day passed in the sky without his beating the woman. We have tried to settle their quarrels time without number, and on each occasion, Uzawulu was guilty. It is a lie, Uzawulu shouted. Two years ago, continued Odukwe, when she was pregnant, he beat her until she miscarried. It is a lie. She miscarried after she had gone to sleep with her lover. Uzawulu's body, I salute you, said Evil Forest, silencing him. What kind of lover sleeps with a pregnant woman? There was a loud murmur of approbation from the crowd. 
Odukwe continued. Last year when my sister was recovering from an illness, he beat her again so that if the neighbors had not gone in to save her, she would have been killed. We heard of it and did as you have been told. The law of home warfare is that if a woman runs away from her husband, her bride prize is returned. But in this case, she ran away to save her life. Her two children belong to Uzoolu. We do not dispute it, but they are too young to leave their mother. If, in the other hand, Uzoolu should recover from his madness and come in the proper way to beg his wife to return, she will do so on the understanding that if he ever beats her again, we shall cut off his genitals for him. The crowd roared with laughter. Evil Forest rose to his feet and order was immediately restored. A steady cloud of smoke rose from his head. He sat down again and called two witnesses. They were both Uzawulu's neighbors and they agreed about the beating. Evil Forest then stood up, pulled out his staff and thrust it into the earth again. He ran a few steps in the direction of the women. They all fled in terror, only to return to their places almost immediately. The nine Egugu then went away to consult together in their house. They were silent for a long time. Then the metal gong sounded and the flute was blown. The Egugu had emerged once again from their underground home. They saluted one another and then reappeared on the Ilo. Home of your queen, roared Evil Forest, facing the elders and grandees of the clan. Yeah, replied the thunderous crowd. Then silence descended from the sky and swallowed the noise. Evil Forest began to speak, and all the while he spoke, everyone was silent. The eight other Egugu were as still as statues. We have heard both sides of the case, said Evil Forest. Our duty is not to blame this man or to praise that, but to settle the dispute. He turned to Zawulu's group and allowed a short pause. Uzawulu's body, I salute you, he said. Our father, my hand has touched the ground, replied Uzawulu, touching the earth. Uzawulu's body, do you know me? How can I know you, father? You are beyond our knowledge, Uzawulu replied. I am evil forest. I kill a man on the day that his life is sweetest to him. That is true, replied Ozoolu. Go to your in-laws with a pot of wine and beg your wife to return to you. It is not bravery when a man fights with a woman. He turned to Odukwe and allowed a brief pause. Odukwe's body, I greet you, he said. My hand is on the ground, replied Odukwe. Do you know me? No man can know you, replied Odukwe. I am evil forest. I am dry meat that fills the mouth. I am fire that burns without fagot. If your in-law brings wine to you, let your sister go with him. I salute you. He pulled his staff from the hard earth and thrust it back. Umo of your queen, he roared and the crowd answered. I do not know why such a trifle should come before the Egugu, said one elder to another. Don't you know what kind of man Ozoulu is? He will not listen to any other decision, replied the other. As they spoke, two other groups of people had replaced the first before the Egugu, and a great land case began. <laughs>